My name is Hassan. I'm, uh, I'm one of the one million people who have come to Europe 2015. Uh, I'm one of the lucky ones because I survived and I managed to get here and I'm on this stage. I'm a privileged human being because I made it. Uh, thousands didn't. I almost didn't make it, as you saw, in that clip which is taken from a big documentary called Exodus, Our Journey to Europe. Uh, I almost, almost didn't make it, but I'm glad I did, because I, not because I want to survive, not because I want to live, it's just the fact that I want to be here and so many other places to tell this story. You've seen it on the telly last year, on every front page, on every news uh, channel, on every, everything, it was that thing. It was people on dinghies fleeing, and people questioned it, why? Why don't they stay in Turkey? Why do they have smartphones? Why are they wearing this? Why are they doing that? There were so many questions about it. What's going on? So I'm here to tell you what's going on. <laughs> um, on June 10th, 2015, I, I decided to pack 27 years of my life in a rucksack and get out. I was in Turkey when I went on this boat, which you just saw with 63 people, including 10 children and 13 women, and it, after an hour of sailing, our boat sank. Uh, no one has died, luckily. We all survived, except for a pregnant woman who had a miscarriage midwater. Now, I had a camera on me the whole time for a fact that I knew that I can film things. I can be on, I can go places where other filmmakers can't go. So I, I managed to film it. But there were, there were so many things that I couldn't film. So when I was on that boat, I couldn't film. I just couldn't film the agony. I couldn't film the, the misery in people's eyes and the fact that everyone, I knew it for a fact because I thought the same, was asking why. Why do we have to do this? Why, do, why am I on a dinghy with 63 people? Why is Syria being bombed by almost every nation in this world? Why can't I go on a flight like a normal human being and go to my destination? And the answer is, I don't have a passport. I don't have a red passport that takes me to almost 180 countries without a visa. And I'm, I, that was my answer. I couldn't film the fact that everyone of that boat was in denial. I was in denial. I couldn't accept the fact that I am on a dinghy sinking down in water and I'm about to die. I just couldn't accept it. Why? Because before I went on that dinghy, I was a normal human being. I partied. I had a girlfriend. She broke up with me after I sank. <laughs> I had a job. I had a car. I had a life. I had best friends. I went out. I partied. I did everything that you guys do. Everything. But I lost it. 12 million Syrians lost it. And then they went on dinghies. We were picked up by the Turkish Coast Guards. We were taken back to Turkey. And then we said, we'll try again. We will try again with the promise that when we get to Greece, which is part of the EU, it's Europe, it's the peak of human rights, we will be sorted. And that's what I always told my friends who were with me and the people whom my cousin, my friend, my friend and his mom, my, my other friend and his dad, we were traveling like a family. I said, guys, we'll get there and we'll be sorted. So we went on another dinghy. The next day, another boat. It was 45 people. Water was cluster clear. It was a full moon. And it looked like we're going to do it. We're gonna, it's going to happen. And from nowhere, there was a light projected on our boat. And I just kept telling people, listen, it's the, it's the Greek Coast Guards. They're guiding us through. Don't worry about it, because people start panicking, and they started moving, and the slightest movement on a dinghy will capsize it again. But it wasn't. It was the Greek Marine Forces. Three military humongous men on an army boat beating us, broke the engine, stole the fuel tank, and left us midwater. And again, that question mark, why? <laughs> Don't you know that I'm fleeing war? And do you think this is how you treat me? 
We were so naive that when they were doing that, we were screaming of police, police, not knowing that they are the police, not knowing that they represent a government that may not, they, they don't want us here. And my friend's uncle was like, what did you say about Europe again? <laughs> We left the old men and the children and the women on the boat, and us young men, we swam for seven hours pushing that boat for seven hours until we got to Lesbos. We got to the Greek island. <laughs> we made it. It's the EU, it's Europe. But uh, expectations didn't align with reality. Expectation was, we're going to get there, and people will welcome us. <laughs> but there was no one there. Why? Because Elan Kurdi was still alive. His photo did not surf yet to everywhere to stir people's emotions. So we walked for ages to get to fresh water, and we got fresh water. And we were not allowed to stay in hotels, we we're not allowed to take cabs, we we're not allowed to go and buy anything. We were just not allowed to be humans. And what's our fault? Not having a passport. And my camera was on filming over and over and over again. I want to film that. I want to make a film about this. I want the world to see how we are being treated. We slept, we stayed for three nights on Lesbos. And then from there, on a ferry to Athens. And from Athens, we walked for ages into the, to the north, to Saloniki. And from Saloniki, we walked into Macedonia. And in Macedonia, they said, listen, you don't, you don't have to walk. We'll put you on a train. I'm like, great, thank you. I love the Macedonians. This is how it should be done. And they stuffed us on this train like pickles. I swear to God, we were not, we couldn't move an inch for five hours on that train. And there were, at, at train stations, we were not allowed to get out. There were police officers blocking every door of the train. And we had to get the bottles of water outside the window for people to fill him up with water and give, it, give him back to us. And again, the question I ask myself, why? I'm being treated like a, you wouldn't treat an animal like that. From the southern border of Macedonia to the northern border of Macedonia, we got to Serbia. And the second hardest bit of the journey is to get from Serbia through Hungary to Austria without getting caught. Because Hungary, unfortunately, uh, they're not really cool with human rights, with all due respect. But they tend to capture refugees, force them to give their fingerprints, and your asylum claim in any other country will be jeopardized because of Dublin Treaty. So we had to get other smugglers. And trust me, it's the worst thing, it's the worst decision you take in your life when you pay your savings, everything you saved up in your life, when you sell your property and give that money to a smuggler, to a human trafficker. But when the world turns a bright eye on you, and when you don't have a passport that takes you on a, on a plane, sadly, here's your only way. I, I regret every penny I paid for those smugglers, because like millions of people, we paid billions of euros to their wrong pockets, but they were our, our only way in. Our smuggler the next time was Marco. A humongous dude, I swear to God, he's like the size of a fridge. And he works for the Serbian Mafia. And I met him downtown Belgrade, and he was like, listen, bro, this is military training, bro. We take you from here, we drop you there. And in my head, I'm like, this is so cool. <laughs> this is like every action movie I've seen in my life. I am a bro with the Serbian Mafia. <laughs> I couldn't ask for more. And I, this, this Marco guy was legit. It was five-star smuggling. We were in BMWs and Audis, 12 of us, in BM, three, two BMWs and an Audi. And we were sitting there, and it was like an Uber. He was like, he would play any music he wants. I was like, shit. <laughs> that's, what I, that's, that's what I signed up for. Only, we got to the Hungarian border, and then Marco goes like, listen, now I slow down and you jump. And I was like, why don't you stop? And then I'll jump. <laughs> Like, no, no, brother, I slow down, you jump, okay. He slowed down, we jumped in the bush, pitch black, we can't see a thing, we still didn't get through Hungary, so we just got scammed. But Marco did not give up on us. Suddenly there was someone 
being like, Marco, Marco. And for the life of me, I wanted to say Polo, but I didn't want to. <laughs> you don't want to mess up with the Serbian Mafia again. We got picked up by this other Marco dude, and he put 26 of us, because there were other people jumping from slowing down cars, 26 of us in a van. The driver was drunk. I was standing on one leg for 11 hours, 10 to 11 hours through Hungary, and the back door of the van broke, so there was an old man holding the back door the whole journey. And again, this is happening because I don't have a passport. I made it. I got to Austria. From Austria, I got to Germany. From Germany, I got to Belgium. From Belgium, I got to France. And then I got stuck in a really awful place called Calais. Oh, yeah. It's no good. <laughs> In the jungle, I was for two months, 60 days in the jungle. And when I say 60 days, every day I walk for four hours to the train station. I jump over five fences, I jump on the Eurostar, I get caught, I get thrown out, and then I walk back to the jungle. 60 days of my life. And then, someone I know got me a fake passport. And my name was Tresho Anatoliev Trianov. I was Bulgarian. It took me a whole week to memorize my name booked myself a flight on a fake passport because I don't have an original passport. And I flew into this country. I was in London. Hey, 87 days were finally over. Six months later, I was granted political asylum. And now I can stay for five years. But despite everything that I've been through, I'm one of the lucky ones. Because I could joke about my journey, I could say all of those things about my journey, but I made it, but thousands haven't. There are still people, 60,000 people right now stuck in Athens, 9,000 people stuck in Calais. There are unaccompanied children. This government is, has pledged to take them in, but they haven't so far. I don't want to get too political, and I don't want to sound like a hippie, but uh, it's so easy to bomb, but it's not easy to drop aid and take in children. This city has a long history of welcoming refugees. London has a long history of welcoming refugees, the UK. And to be honest, if what happened to me could happen to... It happened to me. I'm a 20-year-old now who watches Peaky Blinder and uh, go to the pub every once in a while. It ha could happen to you. I swear it could happen. God forbid, but it could happen. And if it happens to you, you too would want to find somewhere safe to stay until you can go back home and rebuild your country. I think I'm sounding very depressing right now, but I don't want to. I just want to say that government failed us, but you people didn't. Because right now, there are people from all over Europe and the UK, from the Greek islands, all the way to Calais, donating, volunteering, doing everything in their power to help us and to help the people who didn't make it. And this is what's going on right now. It's the power of people helping people. It's the solidarity between people helping people. I don't care who you are, where you're from, what's your faith, what's your color, I want to help you. I'm living now with a family in their spare room in Brixton. I was given a camera by a photographer because he knows that I was a photographer back home. I am greeted with smiles everywhere I go. It's great. It's beautiful. I love it here. I just think we should do a bit more because there are still, the crisis is still happening and there are still people who need help. Thank you very much.